Happy Sunday. How's everybody doing? It's a great day here. Temperatures like crazy warm. So let me make sure it spins up. So you know how we do it. If you got any uh, security questions, just throw them in the box and we're going to go over some videos I did this weekend while everybody else is following through. Yep. I see myself. Adrian Nash, how are you doing? <laughs> Coast MKC, how are you doing? You early. Hopefully you're still here. Oh, man, I'm trying to get motivated. I have to go in the office tomorrow. <laughs> I'm grumpy, <laughs> so, but it's all good. It is all good. So, once again, let's go over the videos I did this week while people were falling in. Let me make sure do I like the order I have, man. Uh, so yeah, that's cool. Oh. Once again, welcome on a Sunday. We're gonna do um, just an intro, intro to um, forensics. What's up, Ghost MKC? Glad you could join us. Um, so this is one I'm gonna do later on the day. There's a lot of wireless uh, implantable medical devices. Those are being hacked now. So if you got a deep brain, <laughs> neuro, uh, ear implants, gastric stimulators, this is the scary one, Cardi cardiac defibrillators and pacemakers, foot drop implants, or I, a few of my friends got insulin pumps. So they make all those. What's up, game over? They make all those wireless. So now, um, what's up, Ravenwing84? Um, so... <laughs> All those devices can be cyber hacked now, right? So that's kind of the scary part about it. So these devices actually have CVEs, which are basically bugs in those devices that people can remotely control, maybe give you too much insulin or speed up or slow down your pacemaker, right? So uh, uh, those device makers have to be more de deliberate deliberate and do their due diligence when they making these uh wireless implantable devices that once again hackers are taking over what's up erica how are you doing so um i'll probably do that one later on today but um like i said it's just kind of a little weird thing but once again everybody puts everything on the internet sometimes stuff they want to be on the internet uh citibank we're getting fake uh phishing alerts uh, you click on a fish, it was taking you to um, clone websites for Citibank. That's so common now, though. So, uh, you know, we're on the uh, Ukraine. There's crypto scams out there. So people are asking you to <laughs> donate to uh, Ukraine with your crypto. Make sure it's actually Ukraine. So all I see in the, imp in the images, potential cyber facts, facts, <laughs> facts. Yeah, that's kind of the scary thing. You would think hackers would have some things off limit, right? But, you know, it's the hacking world. Uh, somebody put on this video, wow, they came out quick with the <laughs> crypto cyber scam for Ukraine. So be careful. If you want to donate cool, uh, if you want to donate crypto cool, just make sure you donate to the actual Ukraine calls uh, for the nation, right? So um, my Ukraine flag with my Bitcoin at the bottom. Uh, I thought this was interesting. The Ukraine government internet got taken out by Russia. Uh, Elon Musk has his Starlink, which is low orbiting satellites that you can do for rural areas to help you to do internet, right? So the Ukraine uh, government tweeted Elon Musk, which I thought was weird, uh, and asked him, could they use his Starlink satellite? He said, okay. <laughs> so, um, so the other question is, is Elon too powerful? You didn't ask the United States government. You didn't ask Congress. You didn't ask Biden. They just tweeted uh, Elon Musk, right? Um, so shout out to him. He has those low orbit satellites for rural and harder places to get um, internet. So uh, the Ukraine government reached out. I did a short video if you want to watch it. Um, uh, the weird thing is, I guess I didn't know, is Amazon shooting their low orbit satellites uh, into this year. So they're trying to have their version of Starlink uh, controlled by Jeff Bezos. So I, I thought that was um, 
I wouldn't say unique or different, but uh, that they were shooting their little orbiting satellites to um, have their um, internet that you can do for that. So I was just thinking from the United States, if we ever got taken out, are we going to reach out to Elon or Jeff Bezos? And it's called disaster recovery. What our disaster recovery would be to use Starlink or Jeff Bezos has a weird name for his uh, satellite project. So those are just some of the things I did, um, videos I did this week. Some of that I went to live. What's up, Christopher? Um, so that was kind of the Ukraine from um, cybersecurity perspective. Uh, my boss is going to be on my channel. Is um, He used to work for the NSA. So we both were saying this is kind of a weird war because uh, Ukraine is actually asking for cyber volunteers <laughs> to uh, help them with Russia. Then Anonymous is actually a hacktivist group with real no real leadership. They actually came on the Ukraine side. So we like, OK, are we just, you know, picking sides and who who's in control of all of this? Or is it just hack what you feel like type stuff? So that was kind of a, a little different from the UK war. And I'm sure we'll be chopping it up uh, with that. So uh, once again, if you got any cybersecurity questions, just throw them in a the box. Um, for your eyes don't know, uh, Professor Black Ops, I've been in the game for 30 years. I used to teach at a local university. I think I'm about done. They tired of me and I'm tired of them. So I've actually taught what we're going over for uh, computer forensics, very introduction. Um, I do introductory classes so people can see different domains in cybersecurity. Uh, this domain, um, I've seen people do it. Um, Forensic guys are very rare. You usually don't keep those guys on staff because you hope you don't get hacked. So you wouldn't need to do forensics. So you usually don't have those guys on staff. We uh, use a couple big vendors uh, to do that if we ever have any issues uh, for that. Um, I taught for 10 years. Uh, I usually teach uh, introduction to computer security. I usually teach introduction to uh, computer forensics. Uh, and I usually teach compliance. And now and then I teach business law. <laughs> For y'all who doesn't know, I have a master's degree. I have an MBA. So, um, so a little bit about me. Like I said, if you got any uh, security questions, salute to Peter M. Just drop them in the box and uh, we're about to get started. It's more of a lecture. Uh, like I said, my classes in the future, I might add some labs to them. But uh, this round, I think it's just eight week thing we're gonna do um if i can find my slides uh it's gonna be more of a lecture uh, of course i always throw real world stuff in there uh once again i like to touch on different domains we were doing aws probably for the last eight weeks um why would i do aws most uh the vendors i do security reviews on most of their stuff is in aws uh, my real job is I'm a computer consultant for a large state agency. I review all the software um, that vendors bring into the to the agency. Because um, if, if for the, the, those who know, is people been hacked through fish tanks and HVA systems and all kind of software. So we try to make sure we review all that software uh, to make sure we're not a victim. So. Let's see. Salute Wally. Can I practice a hack your machine? <laughs> that is a no, Erica, but we will be spinning up some VM shortly in um, AWS. I'm going to have a AWS class, I think, late night on Thursday. You can get the replay, and uh, I'm sure I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to interview you this uh, month, Erica, so I'll, I'll shoot you something. So since it's uh, Women History, I got you on, on deck, Tam. Uh, a few other people I'm, I'm reaching out to. Uh, I work with the head of um, our help desk. Uh, so I'm I'm interviewing different people. So uh, to get my interview uh, skills up. So let's see before we get started. Uh, Raven Wing, what are some foundation skills required to get into computer forensics? Um, understanding uh, networking, understand the basis of computers. Um uh, that's pretty much it. A uh, little legal, but we're going to teach you that, right? Why do you need legal? Um, if something gets hacked, you want to do chain of custody. Um, legally, uh, certain states tells you how to handle that data. Um, two is 
from a private privacy perspective, can you even get that data? All right. How are you getting search warrants to get that? We're going to touch on a little bit there what what the, um, the the security thing is. And two is a lot of times your top forensics guy, they're taking a malware, just assembling it to see how it operated to figure out how it stowed your information. Uh, looking in your logs to figure out, um, looking at the IPs, source and destination, time. <laughs> facts you do, um, to see where that uh, data was stolen. Um, so, what's up, NC workers? So, just uh, various skills. You got to remember, too, this is the intro part. What's up, Sheet? We here. So, let's go on. Uh, like I said, we're just going to touch on it. It's the intro, so we won't get too in there. So if I was up, brother Michael, glad you can join. So we're gonna do a little history part of it. You know, when you do class for real, you gotta go over a little history. <laughs> Shout out to the history. So dinner digital forensics, the application of computer science and investigation procedures, like we talked about from a legal purposes involving the analysis of digital evidence after proper search authority, chain of custody. Validation with mathematics, validating tools, repeatable reporting, and possible expert presentation. It's in October 2012. ISO standard for digital forensics was ratified. It was ISO 27038, information technology and uh, security techniques. So when you do that, of course, you want to be able to repeat it because you're going to put that evidence in court. Uh, we were talking about a despicable act of a, a teacher and a, I think he was a deputy or law enforcement. They did some stuff to the cupcakes and gave them to the kids. But if, um, when we talked about it, they had six hard drives. Then at the end, they only have four. Right. So from a chain of custody and legal purposes, and we're going to get into more. I think all that data they got off those hard drives will not be admissible in court. So we we're touching it out a little more. Take a real world perspective. Here we go. The federal rules of evidence was created to ensure consistency in federal proceedings. These laws are old. It was signed in 1973. Uh, many states rule mapped to it. The FBI Computer Analysis and Response Team CART was formed in 1984 to handle cases involving digital evidence. Back in 1990, Part teamed up with the Department of Defense uh, Forensics Laboratory. Why? Because a lot of people start stealing stuff more online. Uh, people are get caught on more online. We talked about people doing too much on social media and telling on themselves. Right? All that's part of digital forensics. How can you get it? Is this public? Can you? Is it admissible in court? If they put, if you put it on your public Facebook, public Instagram, right? So. That's why they start coming up with these laws and trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. But of course, we have um, amendments to respect. The Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution protects everyone from uh, to be secure from search and seizure. Separate search warrants might be necessary for digital evidence. Every U.S. jurisdiction has a case law related to the admissibility of evidence recovered by computer or other digital evidence. Right, we were talking about is it good? Can I get it if you have it on your Facebook? Uh, if I arrest you, can I force you to open up your phone if it's if you have a fingerprint, fingerprint or a pattern? Right, so um, if, if it's FBI versus you know local law versus versus state police, are those jurisdictions a little different of how you can manage that data? Right, and we're gonna to touch on a little bit of that at a high level. So, from a computer forensic standpoint, right, investig investigating digital uh, devices, including collecting data securely, examining suspect data to determine details such as origin and content, presenting digital information to courts, or applying laws to digital device practices. Digital forensics is different from data recovery. Uh, which involves retrieving information that was deleted by mistake or lost during a prior surge or server crash. Forensic investigation often works as part of a team known as the investigation triad, right? So the triad is vulnerability, threat, and assessment, network intrusion, and detection and instant response, then uh, digital investigation. 
Right. Once again, I work for a large state agency and I've been a co uh, consultant forever. You usually bring in digital investigation because people are trying to hide stuff, right? They're not accidentally deleting something or trying to hide something, right? They're trying to delete it, hide it, and get away with it, right? Um, I should have printed out. Somebody tried to steal uh, credit cards. They put them inside of a picture, right? If you know what a picture is, this one is zeros, but they were hiding credit cards inside a digital picture. There's some called a DLP, Dead Loss Prevention. It, it scans stuff, so you can try to hide stuff inside <laughs> other stuff, right, from a uh, digital investigation. And I'm sure they're going to talk about that. So once again, this is just uh, one domain in, in, in the field of that, right? Uh, vulnerability threat assessment, risk management tests, verifies the integrity of a standalone workstation and network servers. Network intrusion detection and incident response attached by using automated tools, monitoring network and firewall logs, right? Digital investigation is managing investigations, conduct forensic analysis of systems suspected of containing evidence. All right. So now everybody's seen cybersecurity, you know, one of the CSI shows, right? You see them in the logs, you see them tracing stuff, you see them disassembling malware, right? That's part of a digital investigation, right? So, um, and really, you know, it's just really the um, police doing the uh, computer part, right? Digging in deep and what is your um, expertise in doing it? Don't think you're hiding your <laughs> citizen. So once again, a brief history. Back in 1990s, there's an International Association of Computer Investigation Specialists. They introduced training and software for that. The IRS, the IRS, right? They deal with the money. We're talking about that now because they're in um, Cash App trying to track down your anything <laughs> higher than $600. They search warrant programs. ASRA, data created expert witnesses for Macintosh. ILUX currently maintained as an IRS criminal investigation division. Access Data Forensic Toolkit, FTK, is a popular commercial product. They do have an open source version of that too. And um, we might do a few labs coming up in the next week using a couple of those open source tools. So you can see if when somebody deletes some, it's not really deleted. They delete the pointers and you can actually uh, pull the file back. So let's see. So once again, we talked about understanding case law. Because when you do forensics, which I have to promise we don't do a lot of, is uh, taking people to court. When we do forensics, we try to figure out what was stolen? How much was stolen? Uh, did they get away with it? And uh, how much is going to cost us? We very rarely talk about taking people to court. The number one reason is, uh, if you look at most big time hackers, they're in nations that don't. Uh, it's not very nice, and they don't have extradition policies to bring criminals. So once again, you get stuff like Russia, Iran. Uh, most of our enemies are hacking, so that's why a lot of times you don't take stuff to. Um, cases to court um so let's start my understanding of the case law existing laws can't keep up with technology changes we talked about that when statuses don't exist case law uh is used allow legal counsel to apply um allow legal counsel to apply previously similar cases to the current one in an effort to address ambiguity in laws Examiners must be familiar with recent court rulings on search and seizures in the electronic environment, right? So now we're talking about uh, being on the FBI, being on the federal side, being on the uh, law side and legal. So how do we get the information out of your Facebook? How do we seize your phone? How do we seize your computer, right? How do we take your server if you're actually doing server, right? So those are particular laws and court ruling that relates to that, right? Because now we're trying to prosecute the bad guy. Uh, my main job is hardening computers so they never get hacked. So we won't have to try to go get the bad guys. But if we do from a digital forensic standpoint, once again, what does that look like? Right. So we're going to supplement your knowledge, develop and maintain contacts with computer network investigation pro professionals. Join your computer user group in both the public and private sector. Computer technology investigation network meets to discuss problems with digital forensic. An examiner encounters and then consult outside experts right because if something happens and you actually get in court you're going to need a 
forensic expert to talk about how y'all got the data. Is the person um, guilty? What technique did they do to um, steal that data? What's up, Titanium? So now we're talking about how would you prepare to do a digital investigation, right? We talked a little bit about the history. We talked a little bit about legal case law. What are you going to do? How are you going to present it, right? So we're going to break this up in the public sector and private sector. Right? Most of my stuff I usually do is public sector government stuff, right? So just uh, government agency gives you an article. This charter, this uh, rights in Canada, use Fourth Amendment search and seizure. Uh, private organization, what's your company policy violations and litigation dispute? And two, if you look, when you uh, work for a company, usually sign something, you sign up saying you use company computer to do company work. Right? So if you're not doing that, they can uh, uh, legally, you know, arrest you or fine you or try to garnish your wages if you uh uh, damage something. So, so public sector investigation involves government agency responsible for criminal investigation. Fourth Amendment to use uh, constitution restricts government search and seizure. Department of Justice update information on computer search and seizure regularly. Uh, private sector investigation focuses more on policy violation. Right, and they're going to show us too. What's up before the billions? Usually when you log on to a government computer, it tells you this is a government computer. If you do something, it's going to be a thousand dollars and so many years in jail, right? So when you click on that OK button, right, you accept the responsibility uh, for what you do on that on that computer. And if you violate anything, right, they told you what's going to happen. Um, once again, understanding the law when conducting public sector investigation, you must understand the understands laws on computer related crimes, standard legal process, guidelines for search and seizure, how to build a criminal case, computer fraud, abuse act was passed, specific state laws were generally developed later. So two is um, if you send somebody a certain email at work that's not appropriate, right? That falls under your uh, company guidelines. Um, so uh, how do you get data? So uh, I'm interviewing a lady. She does physical security. And part of our physical security at work is uh, email violations, harassment, um, and, uh, uh, from a computer perspective. So she handles all that work. If you're trying to run a business on your company computer, you know, what is the ramification? So uh, she's actually a lawyer. So I'm actually come online. I'm going to talk about kind of the standard. How does she do search and seizure? Um from a company perspective, right? Because even though you're seizing stuff on company perspective, you got to do it in a certain way, right? So you're not violating their 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 um, rights too. Criminal investigation usually begins with someone finding evidence or a witness of crime. Witness of victims makes the allegations to the police or HR if you're at work. Police interviews the complainant writes a report about the crime. Reporters process management desires to start investigation or allow the information to the police blotter. Blotter is a historical database of previous crimes. So part of uh, cybersecurity, too, is um, somebody tries to steal a laptop or somebody uh, sees something that possibly could be a hack, right? They start up the computer and they notice uh, it's ransomware on and it's counting down, right? We actually have to take kind of like this police report person came to work they did this they saw this at 10 23 we did this at 10 24. why do you do that because from an incident response depending on your company you could be in a class action suit so you want to show the things you did so you wouldn't so your company won't be considered negligent right we did the proper things we had the proper software we did the proper reviews we interviewed the proper people Right. So you got to document all these things because um, the agency I work with, we have 30 lawyers on site. So uh, they want to make sure we, we're doing the things so we won't end up in a class action lawsuit. And if we do end up in a class action lawsuit, we did the appropriate thing so they can say, OK, these are the steps. Our team did the right thing. We're not negligible. Right. So. so let's talk about some terms. Digital evidence first responders arrives on an incident scene, assesses the situation and takes precautions to acquire and preserve evidence. 
digital evidence specialist has the skills to analyze data and determine when another specialist should be called in to assist. An affidavit is a sworn statement to support a facts about or evidence of a crime must include exhibits that supports the allegation, right? So that's the legal part, right? We saw somebody steal some, or you saw somebody get harassed, or, or you looked at a certain log and you saw some being stolen, right? So we want to make sure we get the affidavit and the exhibits. Um, we got the log. We looked in the, uh, if you look on Windows, you can see all the processes running. We dumped up everything in the process and we, we dumped the memory so we could see what was happening at that moment, right? So if somebody asks us, ask us a question, we have those exhibits and our um, logs and our, all the evidence we need to support the things we saw at the time of the hack or or what was actually going on. Private sector investigation involves private companies with lawyers who address company policies, violation and legal disputes. Example, even a wrongful termination can fall under um, cyber. The reason why that is a lot of times is if you think you were wrongful terminator, managers talk, they talk to the presidents, they talk to the HR, right? You can request all that in discovery to figure out if you were uh, wrongfully terminated, right? Businesses strive to minimize or eliminate litigation. Private sector crimes and foul, like we talked about, email harassment, uh, falsification of data gender and age di uh, discrimination, embezzlement, sabotage, and industrial uh, espionage, right? All those are uh, included in um, things that will be investigated from a forensic standpoint. Uh, like I'm old, so if I thought I was fired for uh, age discrimination, right, I could request emails to see if somebody was talking about my age versus my skills, or if somebody was younger there, maybe I could uh, get their HR records pulled up to show that I was more qualified for, than them. But so they just uh, hired me, you know, fire me because I'm old, you know, B2B might come and get me fired. He young with all the new skills. They, don't, they might not want an old guy. Right. So those are things from a forensic perspective, internal. So HR is very good about not putting stuff in the email because they know it can be discovered. And I always tell my boss, if my boss, uh, he always like if my boss asked me to do something that I don't think is appropriate for that situation from a from a cybersecurity perspective, I always tell him I work for you, but you got to send me an email, right? Because if you tell me to do something that goes left, right, I need email to cover my butt that you told me to do it. He always like, but I tell him to his face, "Hey man, I work for you, but I need an email." So. You know, because he might want me to delete some or or take some offline. I'm like, I don't think that's the right thing we should do, big boss. But I need an email and I'd be more more than happy to do that. Right. So uh, just throwing y'all a little game. Right. So if you're out there, your boss might ask you to do something. Just say, hey, cool. Just send me an email and I'll do it. I work for you. But sometimes I see people get I wouldn't say set up, but some went left and people certain people don't want to take responsibility. I'm cool. I just need an email. <laughs> I do it ASAP. I just needed an email, right? So, nothing personal. All right. So, let's keep reading. Business can reduce the risk of litigation by publishing and maintaining policies. That's why your company makes you sign all those policies and go over all those policies. Most important policies to define rules for using. We talked about that company computers and network acceptable use policies. Uh, let me take it off. Line of authority states who has legal right to initiate an investigation and who can take possession of evidence and who can have access to the evidence. I'm not having access to any evidence. So I tell my boss, you got that big boss. Uh, I just need that in the email. All right. So. So, like you said, most companies are going to have those policies and um, most big companies have those policies and even uh, smaller companies, um, you know, have those policies. Businesses can avoid uh, litigation by displaying a warning banner. Computers, we talked about that. Forms and users that the organization reserves the right to inspect the computers and network traffic at will. Basically just saying, you're on our equipment, you're on our network, uh, we're watching you, right? So, which everybody should know, that's that's not um, out of bounds or anything. That's what it looks like. So when you log on there, it says United States government, when I worked at DOD, 
They usually tell you how long you're gonna be in jail and what your fine's gonna be. Uh, people know I do security checks and we and I did a couple of videos. Um, Stigs, which is DOD check, CIS, which is government check. One of their big checks is you need this banner when people log on computers, letting them to know that they're logging on uh, company equipment and um, there's reper repercussions if anything happens to that company equipment, right? That's quick standard. So. Simple text that can be used for internal warning. Use of this system and network is for official business. System and networks are subject to monitoring by any time by the owner. Use this system and class can sit to monitoring by the owner. Unauthorized or legal users of this system or network will be subject to discipline. That's standard. I'm sure everybody sees it. Um, if not, <laughs> those businesses need to work on that, right? That's triple standard. Businesses are advised to specify authorized requester who has the power to initiate the investors. Investigation examples of group authorities, corporate security investigation, corporate ethic office. If you work for big companies, they got ethics office, corporal equal opportunity office, internal auditing, general counsel or legal department, right? And part of general counsel, legal department, HR is in there, so. what you what you want whenever you like i need an email facts facts you you are a paralegal extraordinary you need those cyas whatever you need i just need email <laughs> right so people when i first start doing that people start freaking out i'm like uh i disagree <laughs> so i just needed an email so um like I said, I've seen stuff go left in my lifetime, and uh, a lot of people didn't take responsibility for some stuff. I thought they should take responsibility of but as a manager or director, so I just needed an email. During a private investigation, you search for evidence to support allegations of violation of company rules or attack, three types of situation coming, abuse or misuse of computer asset, uh, email abuse, internet abuse, or private sector investigation job to minimize risk of the company. A lot of times, you know, people are smarter. I think people look at inappropriate websites, running companies, stuff on, on business computers, um, uh, just stuff like that. And two is the company, if somebody says the company was negligent, they want to show these policies that they told you what to do and you were negligent, you were overstepping your bounds, right? The distinction between personal and computer property can be difficult with cell phones, smartphones, or personal note, uh, notebooks and tablets. Bring your own devices is common. Some companies state that if you connect your personal device to a business network, it falls under the same uh, rules as the company property. And that's what we do. So I never hook my personal stuff to a company computer. And we tell you, if you use your um personal phone and something happens to our email system and your system's on there we're gonna brick your phone meaning it, it's gonna be unusable or we can wipe your phone remotely right um uh, from a cybersecurity perspective and being safe on that personal conduct involves ethics moral standard of behavior investigator must exhibit the highest level of personal behavior at all times maintain objectivity, maintain credibility. Investigators should also attend training and stay current with the latest technical stuff, right? And that's true for you as an employee, right? A lot of people are looking on your social media, which I think is a little appropriate, inappropriate. Looking on your Snapchat, looking at your friend's Snapchat, who you related to, right? So a company's going to do, we call it a professional dossier to, to figure out what kind of person you are and are you the dreaded are you an employee uh fit are you a cultural fit to our organization right the role of digital forensic professionals to gather evidence to prove that a suspect uh, committed a crime or violated company policy collect evidence that can be offered in court or corporate inquiry investigate the suspect's computer preserve the evidence of a different computer chain of custody route the evidence that takes from time you find it until the case is closed or goes to court right so route the evidence takes from time you find it until the case goes to court making sure nobody's poisoning the evidence or trying to frame you basically right so you gotta have chain of custody to make sure none of that actually happens right they had due care of your stuff uh computers can contain information to help law enforcement determine 
chain of events leading to crime. Like we talked about, you have employee espionage, people stealing employee equipment, people sending harassment emails. A lot of that's done on uh, company equipment that they have logs for or can actually look in your email and find uh, stuff you were planning. Chain of events leading to the crime, evidence that can lead to a conviction. Law enforcement offices, uh, officers should follow proper procedures to acquire evidence. Digital evidence can be altered by the overseeing investigation or investigator. So, um, and once again, you got to make sure uh, they know what they're doing, right? A potential challenge informational hard drive might be password protected. So the forensic tools may be need to be used in order to, in, in your investigation, right? So, so a lot of the tools, forensics guys can crack your password, right? There's um, Jack the Ripper. There's a lot of ways to uh, uh, crack your password. If you have root on the box, you can override that person's password. A lot of times when people leave or we do an investigation, uh, their supervisors have access to people's email and their corporate uh, email. And in that corporate email, I'm like, there's a lot of personal emails. I'll be like, uh, that was a mistake. You should only use your um, stuff, uh, your corporate stuff. Are you using your corporate uh, stuff for your corporate stuff? Shouldn't you use your personal employees and mix business and pleasure? My favorite thing, never mix business and pleasure, right? We want to be consistent. Employees misusing resources can cost companies millions of dollars. Misuse includes surfing the net, sending personal emails, or using the company computers for personal tasks, right? Because that person could do something to another company. That company's suing that person. And since they're using corporate equipment, your corporation could be in a personal lawsuit, right? When I sue somebody, I'm suing everybody in the chain, right? Whoever got the most money, right? So that's why your company's real particular about uh, what you should use your computer on and that you uh, sign these things saying that your company computer should only be used uh, for company resources, All right? Nine times out of 10, your company doesn't care until they get in a lawsuit. Then they're going to start pulling all this stuff out, right? If you're doing a quick email for your kid or are emailing back your doctor, your company really doesn't care. Your company only cares when they end up in a lawsuit, right? And they're going to start pulling all of this out, which is what your legal staff, what you pay them to do, keep you out of trouble, right? Steps for problem solving, making an initial assessment about the type of case you're investigating, determine a preliminary design or approach to case, create a detailed checklist, determine the resources you need, obtain and copy and evidence of the driver. So when you work for a forensic company, especially a big one, they're going to teach you their policies and procedures on how you're going to do things. Uh, what's the appropriate way to do that? And uh, probably in our third week, we probably use a couple of those tools and uh, big copy a couple of drives, sync a couple of drives, delete some stuff, but bring it back. Because once again, we didn't delete the data. We, we deleted the pointers, right? So we we're gonna reconnect the pointers and bring back the deleted data. Now they make a easy. Now you delete stuff. It goes to the trash can, right? You just pull it out the trash can. But we're gonna delete stuff out the trash can and still pull it back up, right? So just uh, basic uh, forensic stuff at a, at a basic level. Right? Once again, I like to go over this at a high level so people can see different domains in cybersecurity. Um, like I said, there's so many um, domains and so many jobs, you know. Identifying the risk, mitigate the, uh, minimize the risk, test the design, analyze and recover digital evidence, investigate the data you recovered, complete the case report, and critique the case. All right? The case is thinking, hey, we're gonna go to court, so we gotta make sure our paperwork is make sure our paperwork is correct. So everybody, anything, you, anything else will be uncivilized. That's what I learned. Is so, okay, you got to sue everybody up the chain because you don't know who really got money. And a lot of times, the sad part about it is, um, bigger companies settle because they just don't want the headache. And depending on how much money they scratch those checks all day, right? You asking for fifty hundred thousand dollars, big company scratch those check all day because if you take them, sue them, that's gonna cost them a million dollars worth of time. They got thirty people in there. If it's part of the C-suite, you you know you get those guys in court too. 
No, nah, they just want to settle a lot of times. Uh, allegedly, I'm not giving out any legal advice. <laughs> Shout out to BDB. I'm learning from no legal advice, no medical advice, no no advice. <laughs> Just overviews. Systematically outline the case detail, situation, nature of case, specific of the case, type of evidence, known disc for or mat, location of evidence. Based on these details, you can determine the case requirements, right? So, um, once again, one of the things we do, which is kind of boring, is every quarter somebody went to dinner and left their laptop in their back seat, right? Their window gets busted. Um, since we have to do a police report uh, to get the insurance for the laptop, that's just part of the forensic process. Where were you at? What time it was? What was in there? And then part of the cybersecurity perspective is, did you have any... Um, proprietary or, or personal or company data on your laptop that got stolen, right? Because then it depending if that has certain data on your laptop, we might have to report to a federal agency, uh, being FERPA for education, IRS, uh, FISMA, um, Graham Leach Briley, a lot of states uh, have um, privacy uh, notifications. If you lose in California, if, if there's a thousand records of personal information, you have to actually report it to the state general state general attorney of uh, California. So you can uh, pay credit and credit monitoring to the citizens of California. Each state's a little different, right? So you got to know those rules to figure out what, what you need to do, right? So that's part of the um, forensic from a security standpoint is what's your breach notification, right? So once again, basic information, acquire their evidence, uh, we're going to do the form, transport the evidence to the computer forensic lab, secure the evidence in the approved secure container, right? So a lot of people don't know when you take your um, laptop in to, uh, we call it Best Buy here or a big department store to get them to look at there. If they find anything on your computer, they got to report that to the local server. Right. If they find porn with kids or something that's not appropriate, they have to report that to the uh, local sheriff. Right. And part of that is chain of custody. Uh, how do they find it? When they find it? Uh, it's called hash and they take a hash of your drive before they start uh, working on it. That hash can tell if they changed any of those files that were actually on your computer. Right. So there's, these are the steps they go through while they're reporting it. Uh, we just talked about that. Prepare for prepare your forensic workstation. Retrieve evidence to the secure container. Make a forensic copy of the evidence. Return the evidence to the secure container. Process the copy evidence with computer forensics tools. Uh, evidence custody forms help you document what has been done with the original evidence and its forensic copy. Also called chain of evidence. There's two types of evidence. Single evidence form. List each piece of evidence, then there's a multi-evidence form. So this is the multi-evidence. So you're looking at three drives, um, two laptops. So you put everything in there, right? Because so when you go to court, you want to list everything you touched, everything you changed, type of hard type, try, type of uh, network adapter. And here it is just a single computer, how you document it. So once again, for us, uh, when laptops come up missing or we do an investigation, we write all that stuff on this form, right? And we do that from a preliminary pre investigation before we turn it over to the uh, forensic companies we're going to hire, right? But but we got to do initial. If you look at the top, that's actually a police form, right? So a lot of stuff before you work on, since it's a crime, you actually uh, have to put in a police report for that. Uh you have to use the evidence bag to secure it. The computer safe products we collect in computer evidence is an anti static bag or impasse. Use well padded containers. Use evidence tape to seal out openings, CD drive bays, insertion of slots for power supplies, electric cords, and USB cables. Um, in the old days, you can actually shock a uh, drive and mess it up. You can't really do that with the new. Um, drives, the new SATA drives, the new um, SSD drives. You really can't uh, damage those with a static shock like you could in the, in the 90s, right? Some of this stuff is pretty old. As you'll see in one of the pictures, 
they show a three and a half this drive. I don't think they make those anymore. I gotta update my slides. <laughs> but uh, write your initials on the tech to prove that the evidence has not been tampered with. Consider computer specific temperature and humidity uh, ranges. Make sure you have a safety environment for transporting storage and until secure evidence container is available. You don't want to have evidence in your back seat and somebody steals it, right? So uh, that's what they're talking about. Uh, a lot of times, um, <laughs> we were talking about that. My boss actually asked the guy, I need you to go from here directly to the place. You cannot stop and use the bathroom. I'm like, dude, that dude, 30 years old, you can't tell me what to do. But uh, they just want to make sure their uh, st uh, stuff is secure, their products are secure, and their uh, computer stuff is secure, right? So I thought that was the funny thing ever. So uh, procedures for an investigator, you need to develop formal procedures and a formal checklist to cover all issues important to high-tech investigation. Ensure the correct techniques are used as an investigation. Once again, you're going to work for a big company. They're going to lay all those investigations out. Um, I think I got I think I got one guy's coming on, and he's actually going to talk about that. Uh, he does forensic stuff, so I'll probably get him come on one of my lives and break it down. Man. So the majority of investi invested works for termination cases involving employee abuse of a corporate uh, assets, right? The majority of investigated work for termination case involves uh, employees abuse of corporate asset. The incident that creates the hostile work environment are the uh, predominant type of cases. Viewing pornography in a workplace, sending inappropriate emails. Organization must have appropriate policies in place, right, to handle that stuff. And I wouldn't say it's common, but once again, that's the most things uh, people have problems with from an uh, investi investigation standpoint. So to uh, conduct an investigation, organization, internet proxy server logs, suspect the computer IP address, the suspect computer disk drives, your preferred computer forensic analysis tools. So when you investigate it, you know, those are the things you're going to look at first is uh, where do they send it from? If it's from their corporate computer, right? There's their IP address that's uh, related to that. So. So recommended steps, use standard forensic analysis techniques, use appropriate tools to extract our web URLs for information, contact the network firewall administrator and request proxy logs, compare the data recovered from the forensic analysis tool to the proxy logs, uh, continue analyzing the computer disk drive data. Right, so when you do stuff on a computer, everybody knows it's in your browser history, uh, some of that's getting right written to your temp directory. If you're sending out emails, a lot of big companies, when you send out an email, they make a copy of it and, and save it, right? For forensic stuff like this. Um, you also need electronic uh, copy of the offending email that contains the message header data. If available, the email server logs. For email systems, the store user messages on a central server access to that server access to the computer so that you can perform a forensic analysis on it uh your preferred computer forensics tool once again uh standard technique obtain an electric copy of suspect and vic victims email folder or data for a web-based email investigation you use tools such as internet search keyword option to extract our related email examine the header of our message of interest to the investigation Right. So when you send out email, there's header information, there's stuff that gets saved in the email. Uh, two is depending on the type of system. Uh, on our on DOD emails, it has a cat card. So this uh, before you send email, you got to put your cat card in there, put your four digit pin. It actually takes your personal email certificate and signs that email with your email certificate. What that is is actually. Um, saying that you and only you uh, sent that email. So that's actually a binding contract with you and whoever you sent that email to, All right? So under attorney-client privileges, rules for attorney, you must keep all findings confidential. Many attorneys like to have printouts of the data you have recovered. You need to persuade and educate many attorneys on how digital evidence can be viewed electronically. You also can encounter problems with your data in the form of a binary file right so 
Part of your attorney-client privileges request a memorandum from your attorney directing you to start an investigation. Request a list keywords of interest in investigation and initiate that investigation. For disk drive examination, you must uh, make two bitstream images uh, using uh, different tools for each image. Compare the hash signatures on all the files on your original and recreate the disk drives. Right? So you never do work on the original, right? You make a copy of the original. Uh, hashing makes sure that the copy was complete and you do all your work on the uh, copy of that original. Right? Uh, methodically examine every portion of the disk, extract all data, run keyword searches on allocated and unallocated disk space. For Windows OS, use uh, specialty tools to analyze your registry. For binary data, like CAD drawings, locate the correct software. For an unallocated data recovery, use a tool that removes and replaces non-printable data. So like we talked about, um, when you delete some and delete the pointers, all right, that's uh, non-printable data is in there, and that's a uh, slack space in there that you need special software to see. And we probably do that in a lab where you can actually look at that slack space for those particular drives. Consolidate all recovery data from evidence from the bit stream. Minimize written communication with the attorney. Any documentation written to the attorney must contain a header stating it's uh, privileged legal, legal communications, uh, confidential work products. Assist an attorney in paralegal and analyzing data. Right, so now with stuff and attorney-client privileges, the court cannot request it. Once again, it's attorney-client privileges. All suspected industrial espionage, espionage cases should be treated as criminal investigation. So if you think your employees are stealing stuff or selling your information, what does that look like, right? The staff you need is a digital investigator who is responsible for disk forensic examination, technology specialist who is knowledgeable of the suspected compromised technical data, uh, network specialist who can perform log analysis and set up network sniffers, Threat assessment specialists are tip, typically an attorney. Those guys are rare. All right. So guidelines determine whether an investigation involves possible industrial espionage incident. Uh, consult with corporate attorneys and upper management. Determine what information is needed to substantiate the uh, allegation. Generate a list of keywords for disk forensic and sniffing monitors. List and collect resources for investigation. So when you start looking through uh, emails, you're looking for certain names, certain words, uh, certain special code words and time in the company, because you don't know if that person was working with other people in the company. So you start doing these detailed word searches to figure out, uh, try to figure out who's all involved. Determine the goal and scope of the investigation. Initiate investigation after approval of management. Plan, planning consideration, examining all emails of suspected employees. Uh, internet uh, search for news groups on message boards. Look at physical surveillance. Most company now has webcams, especially from the IT people. When we walk into server rooms and special rooms, there's definitely a webcam in there uh, watching what you do. Right? Also, uh, facilities, physical access logs for sensitive areas. So when you go in certain areas, you have to sign in and get in those areas, right? Determine the suspect's location, relation with to the vulnerable asset, study the person's work habits, collect all incoming and outgoing phone logs, uh, step uh, in conducting in industrial espionage cation, uh, gather all the personal uh, information to sign and brief them to the plan, gather all resources to conduct uh, in like we talked about, what's your work habits? If somebody start coming on at 2 a.m., right, you need to kind of figure out what's going on or a person's working in a certain parts of database they never worked on, All right? So those should come up in your logs and um, alert your uh, cybersecurity area and teams, right? So once again, surveillance systems at key locations, discreetly gather any additional information, collect all log data from networks, Report regularly to management and corporate attorneys. Review the scopes of the corporate attorneys and management information. Because right? usually they're going to give you a scope of work of where you at and how you doing it, right? Kind of what's going on with that. You have to do interviews and interrogations of high-tech investigations. Becoming a skilled interviewer 
and interrogator can take many years of experience. That's why they have people that actually uh, do this for a living. That's usually attorney, right? Because uh, sometimes <laughs> they want to talk to current employees. They're not going to let the security team do it, right? So there's a certain way you need to do it. So a lot of times, once again, we have a legal staff that handles that. Uh, becoming a skilled interviewer takes many years. Interview usually could conduct to collect information from the witness or suspects about specific facts related to investigator interrogations process of trying to uh, get a suspect to confess uh, roles of digital investigators to instruct the investigator conducting the interview on what questions to ask ingredients for a successful interview or interrogation be patient throughout the session repeating or rephrasing questions to zero in or specific facts from a reluctant witness or suspect uh, being tenacious right now we're talking about going to court. Now we're talking about getting the proper information. I've never seen this done in real life. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there, right? Um, I've done seen investigations done on people they thought was doing espionage or stealing equipment. I've just never seen anybody um, uh, interrogated in real life. Investigators conduct and computer forensic lab data recovery. The customer uh, company just wants this data back. Computer. Uh, forensic workstation, specially configured PC, loaded with additional bays and forensic software. The reason why it's special is when you do a computer forensics, you don't know what the operating system is. So you got to have everything from Linux, Windows, Solaris, Windows 95, uh, Windows 10, Windows Server 2019, 2017, 2015, uh, databases that you need to connect and maybe dump data that they were searching in. So you gotta have an array of uh, tools on your um, laptop or your forensic workstation that you can do those things with. To avoid altering the evidence, people do write blockers on a device. So what does a write blocker do? Enable you to boot to Windows without writing data to the evidence drive, right? So those are special uh, computers to do that. Uh, Back to requirement, of course, you want a Windows 10 write blocker. We're going to talk about a couple of digital forensic software for acquisition and analysis. Target drives to receive the source and suspect data on. Spare PETA and SATA ports, USB ports, right? Because now you can get a, a petabyte almost on a USB drive now with external drive. They're big, so that makes it a lot easier. The other additional useful items, extra NICs, extra ports. Firewire, SCSI cards, disk editors, text editors, graphic viewers, right? People uh, try to uh, hide um, images. So that's why you need those viewers and other specialized viewing tools. When you got the resource for the investigation, items needed, original storage media, evidence custody form, evidence container, bit stream, forensic workstation to copy and examine your evidence, securable evidence locker cabinets or safe, right? What's up, Ty? So, like I said, we're just kind of stepping through, touching our feet into um, digital forensics. And this is kind of overview what you need and kind of what does the job do. Uh, you always want to avoid damaging evidence. The steps you want to meet the IT manager, interview them, fill out your evidence form, place the evidence in a secure container, carry the evidence to the computer forensic labs, complete the evidence custody form, secure evidence by locking the container. Uh, bitstream copy is a bit to bit copy of the original storage medium. Extract copy of original disk. It's different from a simple backup copy. Uh, backup copy only copies known files. Backup software cannot copy deleted files, email, message, or recovery files. When you do a bit copy, it gets all of that uh, deleted files and everything. You get an exact disk image of that. So that's why you gotta have the proper uh, software. Bitstream image files contain a bitstream copy of all the data of disk or partition, known as an image or image file. Copy image file to a target disk that's matched the original disk image, manufacturer size, and the model. Right, so it's going to stream it. It's going to copy everything on that disk. Right. Obviously, those are three and a half copies, so I need to get it. these slides are old. But no, shout out to that. So you're doing the original, the image disk, and the target. Create an image transfer. Uh, each bit of data from the original disk to the same spot on the image disk, right? So it goes from that to the image disk to the target disk, right? The exact same spot, right? So when you go to court, all right, you want to make sure you get that. 
Appreciate that. She uh, almost done. Hang in there. <laughs> First rule of computer forensics preserve the original evidence, conduct your analysis only on the copy. Several vendors provide MS DOS, Linux, Windows acquisition tools. Windows tools requires a write blocking device when acquiring from FAT or NTFS file systems. Those are servers. When the job is recovered from data, deleted files, file fragments, completed files, deleted files lingers on a disk until the new data is saved on the same physical location. Tools can be used to retrieve re deleted data. Uh, we probably, um, in the next couple of weeks, get the free version of uh, USB fax <laughs> uh, of our autopsy. That's one of the forensics tools that's used in the industry. So we'll look at that. Steps to analyze USB drive. Uh, start autopsy, create a new case, type the case name, select the working folder, select the data source, select the image, configure and ingest modules. All right, steps to display the contents acquired, views, file types, extensions, documents. Uh, you can tag and comment on them. You can create new tag buttons, search for information related to the complaint. Data analysis can be the most time consuming task. That's actually a topic. Uh, autopsy part of this called sleuth sleuth kit right so you're gonna put the case name chapter right so we're doing evidence right so we documenting everything because uh theoretically you're gonna end up in court right i've never ended up in court but i've seen some cases in there so part of autopsy is you can do keyword searches display the results in the window click each in the file export the data to the folder search for specific file names you can generate a report of activities, display binary and non-printable data in a content viewer. There's a lot of things in there. So you would do your keyword search, George. You could do exact match, substream match, or regular expression, right? Because you're looking through email. So if you're looking for a certain type of email, you want to search through for uh, keyword phrases that that person could be um, um, working with somebody else in the company that... Uh, you want to track down so you want to search everything on that drive to make sure um like i said you're doing a complete search and investigation of that employee uh once again these are the images these are images uh that that search went through uh it brought up george so anything with george and those images those are text files if you look at the end so it's readable so it bring up all those files and help you look in them if that person was trying to hide some on their computer Right, you want to do searches and once I say once again do an investigation on that computer. Right? Uh, same thing, you do that over there is the ASCII values, and there you can uh, where those dots at. That would actually show you the actual letter or image of something if somebody was trying to hide some on on the drive. Right, so that's what it looks like. So we would probably do next couple of weeks do those searches so you can actually see them done, like in a lab scenario. So. This is just completing a case. Like I said, you go into court, you want to do a final report. Uh, the autopsy report helps you do repeatable findings. What steps you use to find them? They have a report template because obviously you got to write it up and give it to the, the management if, if you're talking about uh, espionage or trying to find something, right? Suspect did or did not commit a crime or violate a company policy, right? So in the end, that's what you're going to have to uh, figure out, right? And two is, that's going to make it a legal case or not right uh you want to keep a journal of everything you do answer the six uh, w's who what when where why and how you must also explain computer and network processes the report generator generates the report in uh plain text html or excel right so that's it so you're asking yourself the following questions how could you improve the performance in the case did you expect the results you find? Did the case develop how you expected it? Do you have the documentation thoroughly? What was your feedback? Did you discover any new problems? Did you use new techniques during your case? All right. So once again, that was it. I just kind of wanted to touch the introduction of forensics, right? It's just something I, we don't talk about much in this space. Like I said, uh, I don't really do a lot of it uh, personally, like I said, but it is a, it is a domain. Um, those guys get paid uh, a lot of money. I dropped the link if you want to come up. Like I said, I just wanted to 
do a little computer forensics. It's just something people are not aware of. And um, there's a lot of shout out to um, Adrian. There's a lot of lawyers who um, do that for a living. And when you take computers with legal, because we talk about hackers, we're talking about get them, but in the end, really, you want to lock them up, right, and get them in jail. And it's the process you do to make that happen, right, to get them in there. What's up, man? You're welcome, Raven Wing 84. Peace out. What's up, Lance? So I just wanted to touch on that. Um, like I said, we're going to do this for about eight weeks, and we're going to dig in a little deeper. Um, I'll get a couple of those tools, um, autopsy, and we'll look at the disk drives and see hidden files or files that that you deleted that aren't quite deleted. Uh, we look at building a case at a high level from, from a forensic standpoint. Once again, I like to uh, touch on different domains. Cybersecurity is uh, so large. And um, once again, it's just a domain in that. So it's super nice out here. So Professor Black House is probably going to get a little exercise and, and do a little walking. So I just want, like I said, uh, if you need anything, uh, reach out to me, Professor Black Ops at gmail.com. Um, if you need 15 to 20 minutes, want to chop it up and talk about a specific thing or or something, you know, getting in cybersecurity, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, if you want to, we can just chop it up online on the live. So just let me know how it, how it works for y'all. Like I said, I, I came here to help people. Um, I work with a lot of people. Shout out to Keith the Techie, Linux. Um, Black Heights, Master IT, Tech G. There's a lot of people, you know, I might send you to, you know, that that uh that can help you better. Like there's a lot of people that um trying to get into the industry, especially cybersecurity. I tell people uh get into uh, networking fundamentals, programming fundamentals, do some sock work, you know, some entry level stuff before you get into cyber cybersecurity. Right. Um, to, to So you can get the bag so you can get that up. So there's a lot of uh, great channels out there with fundamental. I just got out with my homie network, bruh, <laughs> network B-R-U-H. And we're going to do some collaborations. I'm going to hook up his uh, um, physical Cisco to my uh, AWS cloud so we so we can so we can do a little stuff. So so, yeah, I'm going to be partnering with a lot of people. So. We didn't get any kind of training apparently to shoot it out for uh for, for computer stuff. Yeah, I think that's um I think it's newer stuff now. Um with that a lot of big companies are trying to you see, at least from an HR perspective, to make sure they have that cover. Um, like I said, I'm interviewing with somebody, she does our internal ethics and our internal investigation. Uh she's actually a lawyer, so I'm gonna have her on my channel. We're gonna break that down and we're gonna ask her some 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 uh um questions about you should consider teaching the course in paralegal program I, that's true i i never thought about that so but yeah so um once again i just came on i'm gonna hang on see if you want to come up i dropped the link i dropped again like i said i just want to touch on uh different things on my channel um different ways to um get in the industry different uh things people don't even know about like because when i was younger I, I really didn't know about uh forensics i knew about hackers and you know, looking at logs, but I just never knew that as a whole separate domain of, of how you do stuff, right? So, like I said, we're going to touch on that for about eight weeks, then we're going to dig in there. Thursday, I'm a, uh, probably Thursday night, I'm going to start um, doing my AWS labs. I've been really grinding on AWS. If you look back on my videos on Sundays, I did AWS for like, I want to say like three months. So, um going to switch over to forensic AWS. The reason I do AWS is I do security reviews as a security analyst. So I need to get, I need to get better at AWS cuz all our vendors are um have a software as a service and I have to review that uh, to make sure it's secure for different clients and different agencies, right? A lot of those are federal and they have certain uh, security requirements. So um, if that's it, I want everybody to have a great weekend. Enjoy. It's warm here. And I'm in Indiana. It's usually cold. It's about 60 degrees, which is almost summer. So I think I'm gonna give me a little walk in. I gotta get back on my exercise. I ain't do anything in a pandemic, but eat. Professor Black House gotta do a little better. So I'm gonna shout out once again, reach out to me. Uh, I'm sure I see a lot of y'all on these YouTube streets. Um, like I said, I enjoy collaborating with so many people, so many smart guys in here. Uh, pleasantly surprised when I came to YouTube. Uh, 
once again, though, the real numbers, though, are, are small. So that's why I came to um, YouTube. I think this is a great industry to be in. Um, there are a few issues, but great place to get the bag. Once again, I've been in IT for 30 plus years. I started off as a junior programmer. I've done everything <laughs> under the sun, program, system admin, web admin. Uh, my tool stack for the programmers out there is uh, Java, Oracle, PL SQL. I'm an old guy. Uh, I do a little MySQL. <laughs> I've been a DBA, so I, I've done a little everything. Um, I think I'm going to try to be an AWS SRE site reliability engineer. I think it's going to be my next move. Uh, take my cybersecurity. I miss building stuff. So get back into the architecture, architecture role and review architects architecture from a cybersecurity perspective how you build your three-tier how you do your network controlling your network secure coding right so that's the cool thing about security we touch everything really in um it from when you develop an application how do you develop it your policies and pre procedures to make sure your management signs off on what you're doing so um that's really what my channel is about once again uh Professor Black Ops, please subscribe. I'm out. I'm about to uh, walk and go get me some barbecue. That means I'm failing, though, I guess, if I'm eating barbecue. <laughs> Everybody have a good weekend. Monday's almost here. Relax <laughs> and enjoy. I'm out.